13th floor. floor. The 13th floor. floor. Welcome everybody to the 13th floor where the furniture isn't always the best, but the views are amazing. I am your moderator, B. Jones, and this week I am joined by my main man in crypto, our resident DJ, Barry B. Fresh. What's happening, my brother? What's going down, world? We here. We live. We ready. Special guest. Let's get it popping. Special guest this week, man. We're going to get to you in a second, but first we got to go down to the 90s, bros. Rudolph, Mike Matthews, what's happening? Rudolph, happy Easter to the fans. Happy Easter to everyone. Actually, due to, uh, I mean, from Tri-State, his, his real name is Rue Matthews. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rude. Very welcome, Progress. Very welcome. Very welcome. We got our resident BFBG and the little guy who tricked me this morning. I thought that was Namdi, but it's actually a Renze. What's going on, Faison and fam? Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, glad to be here. Happy. I noticed that on my intro, I say so and a lot. So, going to avoid those words today to uh, dang it. Fail. Yeah. <laughs> Keep it going. 30 seconds in. Already failing. Last but not least, our resident life coach and maestro, Coach K. What's going on, bro? What's good, man? I'm here celebrating um, 10 years since I rose up out the ditch Ooh. at 100 miles per hour into the ditch. That was on Easter Sunday. Wow. Yeah, 2008. Wow, uh, actually, so we a little bit more than a year because it was March 23rd was Easter that year. So, mm -hmm. uh, so just celebrating 10 years of uh, a second life. And um, man, also, it's just funny, man. You know, I, I say it to y'all all the time. For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. So mm -hmm. got word that my my only uncle that is still in Trinidad passed this morning. Oh, man. Wow. Yeah, crazy, man. Right. But look, I ain't, that's not to add a somber note. My man had multiple blockages to multiple heart valves. So, you know, hey, he's the just... first um, sibling from my grandmother and grandfather um, that's gone home to be with them. So all to the good. Um, I just saw him uh, in 2012. So, you know, mm -hmm. shout out to you, Uncle Tony. Um, I'm sure you're happy now. Uh, and to my cousins, man, I got two cousins that are still in Trinidad. They're by themselves now. So, I mean, they're older. Mm -hmm. They're not older, older. They're younger than me, but um, shout out to to them. So, yeah, man. But let's keep this thing going. We ain't going to be on no somber note. That wasn't. Nah, man. We good, man. We celebrate life here on the 13th yeah. floor, man. Absolutely. Tell, tell the cuzzos to come on to the stateside and bring some cocoa bread with them. Ooh. Wow. Um, we don't have cocoa bread in Trinidad. Um, uh, so we can get you some roti. bait. Some roti. Some shark, maybe some roti skins. Yeah, so we can yeah, do all that. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So, and, uh, get your eyes together, Brett. Get your eyes. Whatever, man. It's, it's it's not all the same, but I thought that you know it was it was universal. Nah, hey, cocoa bread. That's down a, down Jamaican the thing, thing to the wrong. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. Moving right along, man. We got our we went we put it out there in the universe and went and she came to us. We got our resident angry black female as a guest on the podcast today. How are you, ma'am? I'm well. I'm well. And it sounds like you fellas are. Well as well. So thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is my first podcast. So um, it's kind of a special moment. Oh, good. We're happy to celebrate with you. And uh, welcome, welcome. Absolutely. Yes. yes, man. Welcome to the podcast. We want to jump in. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun today. So, you know, like we said earlier, feel free to express freely. We'll have a lot of fun today. But since we have you here, uh, I want to talk about the ABF movement. Um, and how you've been working to the stigma in the eyes of a lot of people um, and the amount of positivity that you promote and, you know, uplift that you promote on the page. So I want to start by what inspires you to utilize that moniker, the angry black um, female? You know, I live in a world where <laughs> that's pretty much how I'm addressed and perceived and experienced on a daily basis. And I saw that even more so after the reason I wanted to just get my frustrations out and um, I wanted to do it under alias and so I was like well what better way to do it than to kind of like take ownership of a term and kind of flip it on its head and so I, I went online and I just created this platform and for me at the moment 
when I did it a year ago, it was personal. I, I just need an outlet to have, I don't even know my voice be heard necessarily, more so just to release it into the universe so I could let it go. And over the past year, like my goal wasn't for it to be a movement. It was supposed to just be a blog. And it has grown into a movement and a brand. And, and, and claiming I'm an ABF. And so it's it's been organic. I, I don't know if I necessarily set out for it to become what it's becoming. It's really amazing. I mean, I live in an ABF house. So from my uh, <laughs> from from my lady down to my daughter, man, my daughter picks up that hat and tries to wear it to school, and I'm like, ah, baby girl, you can't. I don't think you can wear this to school just yet. You know, I don't want you to 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 bring on that pressure, especially the charter school that she goes to, and some of the things uh, I will say, the systemic, the system within the char- charter school. I'll say it's just not conducive. Oh, trust to me, I get it. I mean, you know, when I'll go to events and I'll have on my stuff and. It's a very polarizing term. Right. So some people will walk up to me, like particularly black women, like, girl, I'm like, I need mm-hmm. a shirt. And they'll identify with it. Um, then others, older black women sometimes um, have a visceral reaction. The ones that surprisingly give me the worst <laughs> reaction are black men. Um, white people love it. And it's interesting because when I have people that have a visceral reaction, I explain to them the purpose of the platform, which is really to redefine false narratives about women of color through socio-political commentary. And our slogan is, we aren't angry, mm-hmm. we are just black, female, and been woke. And what I find is that sometimes when we enter spaces and we just tell certain realities, mm-hmm. uh, we're considered angry. And it's interesting because some of those realities that we've been trying to tell certain spaces for years now that some of those realities are impacting other populations in a way that they've never been impacted before, they're finally like, oh, they almost think that they've come up with these new realizations that we've been speaking about for years. Um, But then at the same time, you know, while sometimes we enter these spaces and we're just telling our reality and it's perceived as angry and we're not, sometimes though we are angry. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that we as black women also should be entitled to, to that emotion. Um, so, you know, sometimes on the page, most time, if you've been to the page, most of my content is about uplifting people of color and particularly women of color. Uh, so that's most of my content, but sometimes I do have a rant and I tell the world why I would add. So I think it's a good balance of both. So you mentioned, um, black men, uh, seem to be a little bit put off yes. by it. Um, but white men love it. Or white so, people in general. <clears throat> okay, white people yeah. in general. So I guess my question would be, because I could, I could understand how that could happen just in seeing the name, because most black men will feel like they are in the crosshairs of that anger. So is that necessarily truth? Or, or is that just something that's a perception that's part of the whole movement? I think it's both. I mean, normally when black men approach me, I get the same thing. Why are you so angry? Or I'm, I'm normally I'm a very smiley person and be like, oh, if for somebody who's angry, you sure enough are smiling a lot. It's always like a sarcastic uh, um, response to it rather than trying to understand why I have on this logo and why I'm wearing this across my chest when I go out into the world. Um, when it comes to the black man, I mean, I think most black women that I associate with, I mean, we love you guys. We are here to support you guys. And we are rooting for you. Um, Stephon Clark, it's so interesting to see the predicament that black women can be in sometimes with black men. Um, I'm not sure if y'all saw his tweet about black is beautiful. You guys see him? Stephon Clark. No. So in May, um, somebody on Twitter wrote black is beautiful. And his response was on Twitter. I don't want nothing black, but an Xbox dark bitches bring dark days. Um, really? I'm going to talk about it on ABF tomorrow. Um, how old was this young man when he, when he wrote that? Well, this was May, May 2nd. So what's last, that? This, yeah. Last, last year. A year ago. Um, yeah. 
and you know his, his the child the mother of his child is an Asian woman. Um, so when I see things like that, it just talks about the, it, it. It so just captures the predicament of being a black mm-hmm. for you guys so much. We're on the front lines, and then sometimes just the the favor isn't returned or seeing our value and my I'm speaking in generalizations right now. Mm-hmm. So not saying that this is you guys. Um, sometimes it's just not, it's just not returned. I mean, I think that I talk about this quote almost every week on ABF, you know, the Malcolm X quote that the most mm-hmm. disrespected, mm-hmm. Um, protected and neglected person in America mm-hmm. is the black woman. And so sometimes we, we really feel that way. Um, and it, it's especially hurtful when it comes from black men. So when I wear my logo out in the world, sometimes I just wish a black man would approach me and say, why, sister? Or how can I help? I've, I've yet to get that from a black man. I mean, I think it's kind of hard with that um, because it's polarizing, right? So I, I, I'll i come back to Stefan Clark and, and that tweet or whatever, yeah. because there's, that's just deeply rooted in you know, systemic For things sure. and in the minds of, of a black man and not raised. But when you see an angry black female, um, I think a little bit of it, and maybe I'm just speaking from my own experience, um, it's it's an attack when you first see it on the man because you automatically think that, or it's automatically assumed that the man, black man, is the cause behind that. So you, I, I get how you would bring attention to it, but it's like, it's not in a in a manner that is, I guess, the best way to, to to approach the problem. It's like you throwing gasoline on a fire, almost, on first look. Well, I guess, well, the brand is not for black men, you know? Absolutely. So I don't know if the brand is necessarily to even have a conversation with black men. It's more so a conversation for us as women of color. Um, I guess black men do have that emotion because when I do uh, sell my merchandise, one of the, when men buy it, their joke when black men buy it their joke is oh yeah i'm definitely buying one of these for my wife and so i guess that's what you're saying is true um but i don't know if we would necessarily feel like you guys are the cause of it i i think we all understand that it's about systemic conditioning of people of color that is the cause and white supremacy and being raised in a system of oppression is the cause which Um, is why which is why white people love it Oh, because, because they look at it and they're like, oh, it's our, divisive. our divisive tool is still working. Exactly. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I don't know. It's just interesting with black men. I mean, above anybody that I interact with, they're the most interesting one. You guys are the first people I've ever had a legitimate conversation with that are black men about the, the, the term. And I think yeah, that's, so- that, that's, that's really important because again, seeing that and not knowing everything behind the angry black female, um, this is the opportunity for you to kind of start that conversation um, with us as black men. So we don't uh, give that initial reaction. And it's the completely wrong reaction because once you go to the page and you look at the things, and like I said, the positivity and uplift, when you think about your message behind it, yeah, it's branded for black, black women, but it's not necessarily a divisive tool the way that you're using it in our community. Oh, yeah, absolutely not. I mean, it's all about celebration. It's all about collaboration. It's all about community. Um, And even, you know, I've had, so I have had one guy ask for me to make an angry black male shirt for him. I would never. Um, (laughs) And I've had, you know, I've had some white people come to my events and one girl, she was so respectful. She, it was an ABF event and she asked, can she come? And Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, of course. And I was like, and I appreciate you for asking, for having respect for this space mm-hmm. before you entered it. And so then she asked certain things about like, what can she wear? And I was like, you can wear the brand. I was like, you don't have to be a black woman to just identify as an ABF. Because mm-hmm. we're not truly just angry black females. It's about as long as you're down for dismantling false narratives about women of color, you can too be an ABF. So I, I think you hit on something that's key and you talked about the, the systemic oppression of our people. And that is absolutely the, the catalyst um, of this division because really and truly we should have angry black households, angry black communities at this point. Um, but we don't sustain that for any um, viable length of time. 
Mm -mm. Uh, we, we, we're very event driven and we're very reactive to things that happen, which is what makes us angry. But then you give a, a little bit of time and we go back to doing just what we were doing before that event occurred. Um, so it's very interesting um, to hear your experience thus far, uh, because I think we definitely the guys here, we all um, aspire for uh, an angry household because that gives things priority you then understand what is what what is really um important and what's not because i think we get caught up in trivial little things that in the end don't really mean much um to the progression of our people so um i think once you can get your message out there and people really understand that and we're definitely here to support you in doing that um i think it starts to make more sense and you find more people adopting um the message behind the movement Oh, I mean, well, the second people come to my page, they get it. Or the second mm -hmm. anybody has a conversation with me, they get it. It's the people that, you know, just judge a book by its cover and keep on moving. Um, that are the ones that, that, you know, you know, they just turn a blind eye to or turn their nose up and then they keep it moving. Um, but I, I, it's, it's like, literally, if you come to my page upon first sight within reading like three sentences, you'll see what the community is truly about. I agree with you about, um our just who how we can behave sometimes as people of color i mean i think about the langston hughes quote a lot negroes you know we're sweet and docile we're meek humble and kind and beware of the day we change our minds and i haven't seen us change our minds yet it's like i pray literally that's one of my prayers every day when i wake up that we have changed our mind today have is today the day that we finally are going to change our mind um you know when i think about the stefan clark even the tweet Oh, it's so interesting. I'm not on Twitter. So mm. when I, so I went and I looked because I, I saw the article and I wanted to make sure that the tweet was genuine. And mm -hmm. unfortunately it was. And so then after I saw his tweet, I just wanted to go in the comment section to see if any dialogue had been had since his, since his murder. Mm -hmm. And it has. And it's, it was such a divisive conversation among Black people, of course. Um, you had the Black women who were rooting for him still. Like, I don't even know why we're talking about this tweet. Um, it has nothing to do with what has happened to him. And then you had like some hotep black brothers that were like, oh, this one guy, he wrote, anyone on the same side as white supremacy is not a victim. And he just wanted to completely disregard this young man's murder. And I, just because of his tweet. And it's so interesting to me, because even though his tweet of was that was an attack on me as a woman of color i still wanted to protect him in that moment because i knew that he didn't know any better right exactly but even in that moment it's just like y'all aren't black women to you all i mean you it's no way for you to quite understand it but being the intersection of a woman being the intersection of a, a minority and particularly a black female minority and then for myself I'm a lesbian and I live in the South. I have these intersections of so many different realities that make it really hard. It's like, you know, we, we've, we've been assigned these roles as the Mammy or the Jezebel or the Sapphire. And regardless, whether we're taking care of you by way of nurturing you, whether we're taking care of you sexually, it's just always just so much pressure on us to be last and to take care of others first. Um, and we've been conditioned and programmed that way. And so for a very long time. For a very long time. And I even when I just went through the tweet, I just saw the black woman again protecting. Always protecting. Even if you are going against my best interest as the black woman, I'm here to protect you. And so I, I've just really not only are am I hoping that we change our minds about how we fight systemic oppression, but I hope that we change our minds about how we can also start to take care of black women. I absolutely believe that that's the case, though. Um, I feel like we, as men on the 13th floor, are very progressive when it comes to that, right? I mean, we're very supportive of all of the, the Black women's movements, women movements in general. We've spoken about them in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that we're entering a space where we, as men, are becoming more educated as it comes to how we interact and how we protect, how we love, how we, we, in, uh, how we handle the Black woman. Um, mm. you, know, you hear a lot more queen speak. You, you, you see a lot more acceptance of 
the black woman and all of their natural facets. Um, and I, I feel like the natural movement, which was probably what, maybe 10 years ago for you, for you all, was the spark and the resistance that you received from that kind of carried over and you were strong enough to still be natural in your own right. But now you have more men that are uh, accepting and understanding of what that means and what it means to be natural. So I think we're entering a space where we are beginning to, to realize how important the woman is to the family structure and how important it is for us to lift you all up. You know, that's, uh, I so appreciate you for even talking about hair. <laughs> like, <laughs> so the fact that you guys as a group of black men understand how important that is. So I'm natural. I actually went natural before it became a movement. I went natural when I was an undergrad. So that I first cut all my hair off in 2001. Mm -hmm. um, at the time I did it, there were no natural hair products. Um, it was just horrible. <laughs> and at the time I didn't know what I was quite doing. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm natural, you know, and I'm older and we're also in this time of just extreme consciousness about what it means to be a black woman. Mm -hmm. I, like I had a breakdown last year, like when I looked in the mirror one day, because before I looked in the mirror, I was looking up something about hair and somebody said, I'm going natural. And I saw another sister say, sister, you can't go something, you can't go back to something that you already are. Like you just mm. are natural. Mm. You're not going there. If anything, you're returning there. Mm. You're right. And I was like, like it blew my mind. Like, and then I looked in the mirror and I was like, to have to go through this process of accepting who I am and being open to returning to that person. I don't think that people outside of a black woman's body understand just how difficult it is for us to look in the mirror and love us, love ourselves. Cause we are programmed not to love our kinks, you know, and then even natural, the natural hair movement. Oh, that's also helped to, how do I say this? almost depressed the black woman's self-esteem in a, in, a, in a way. Cause I'm not sure if you all keep up, but when you see these natural hair commercials or these natural hair ads, it's the mixed chick. Right, with the curly with natural the curl, hair. Yeah. So if you a sister that got real Negro hair, <laughs> it's tough out here. Cause, cause, it's, Cause yeah, we want you to have natural hair, but it has to be a particular type of natural hair. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be mixed with a particular type of, of Eurocentric strand. Mm -hmm. And so even that makes it hard. And even in the natural hair community, when you see these natural meetups, you'll see a particular type. You know, you'll see people that have black hair that's locked. You'll see the mixed chicks with the mix and the mix. I mean, that's actually a name of a brand, the mixed chicks and their mixed hair. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you have to. And so now we have to find a way to even love ourselves in the going natural movement. So. I mean, it's, it's just hard to explain it, man. It's just a lot. But I've finally gotten to the point being natural for 15 years where this past year is like that breakdown helped me love myself. I, I looked in the mirror for the first time in a really long time and was like, my black is beautiful. And mm -hmm. it's because of, I give credit to social media because, you know, like daily affirmations, you know, your mind really starts to believe what you tell it. Mm -hmm. seeing yes. that online every single day other black women they finally convinced me that yes you're right my black is beautiful yeah it sucks that I can't go swimming all the time <laughs> or when I run my blowout's gonna be damned but when I <laughs> compare the pros versus the cons now I, I'm able to love myself versus it was the opposite I used to only focus on what's bad about my hair um so I think we have a similar, a similar fight in that instance, because I think part of, a large part of the problem with us as men is how we do love ourselves and how we, we're taught to love ourselves. Because if we did know the power that we possess and we came into that at an early age, we wouldn't get so far off the track. And when we do start to return back to that natural state, as you said, nobody like myself in my locks, I think, I really think that that was a catalyst or a turning point in my life four years ago where I, my mind started to open a lot more. I was able to receive 
a lot more. And I was able to look in the mirror, realize who I was as a black man and start that transition and changing process. Now that still happened over time. Um, but being it, that, that same struggle or sense of self and sense of self-worth, it, it, I think we, we share that, that common fight as black men and women. Well, that's good to know. I mean, it, it, I mean, it is, it's just good to know. And I appreciate spaces like this that allow us to have the conversation to know that we're actually going out into the world with a lot more similar struggles than we might have discussed. Mm -hmm. um, and we, it, it might be an easier way to bridge that support system between black men and black women um, that I'm not necessarily sure just based on feedback on my page that black women feel like they're getting right now. I don't think they will. I, I mean, like, go ahead, Faison. No, I, I think that the hair is a great catalyst to start a conversation. I mean, most, um, and I say most because I don't want to generalize, but most of uh, you know, your black men now understand uh, natural hair mindset. They, they know what black hair is like. They know that the struggles that there is, but they now understand, you know, the, the process behind it. My wife, um, you know, has been natural all her life. Well, every, you know, since she was like five, she's been natural. So I had to learn that process. And I, you know, I'm grown, I grew up in Philadelphia. So it was always perm, 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 straight hair, straight edge, you know, um, hot comb mindset. Mm -hmm. So to learn that the the struggle, learn the the awesomeness, the ability to adapt, the ability to be um, flexible, to have all kinds of styles and natural look. It took me some time to to grasp, but once I grasp it, I I look at someone who has a permanent figure ass. Why you're so you literally can't do anything but wear a rap style, um, and no, I grew up in the '90s, so the rap was the thing. Go oh, get your hair permed, get it wrapped up, it has to be straight. But there's so much more you can do with a natural, um, with your with your natural style hair. You, I mean, there's more so much, and like you said, we've been limited and told that wasn't cool. But then you look back at all the imagery that's been put out there and everyone's trying to emulate the ability we have naturally with our hair. Um, so that's a great conversation to start with and to get everyone kind of tied into, uh, get, 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 get it started, shall I say, conversation. I think so, because I mean, you're talking about how you had to go through a process to learn, just like you had to go to a, through a process to learn how to love it, your wife had to go through that same process to learn how to love herself. Exactly. And if you guys could have a conversation about what both of y'all's journeys were like, that's just amazing. I mean, for me, I told you all I'm a lesbian. My wife is mixed. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I was telling Brett, I was like, there are certain conversations because, you know, it's hard to explain being gay sometimes to straight mm -hmm. people. Um, <laughs> but I have a wife and she's tall and, and muscular. You know, she's, she's a PE teacher and a coach. So she has like, I call her a Nike ad. She has light green <laughs> eyes, you know, she's just, she's what society says is beautiful. Right. And so then I too struggle with, okay, well, am I conditioned? Because this is what I found to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and she's nothing like what I am. That's and funny because so, I was going to ask that question. Oh yeah. I mean, I have to, <laughs> I, I have to go, I'm telling you a lot goes through it. Like when me and her first got together, I had like it, serious internal struggles. Because I was like, why? And every woman I've dated has had these, these type of characteristics, a particular type of hair, a particular type of eye color, you know, skin tone didn't really matter too much, but I know I'm too conditioned. And then in addition to having to check myself about that, I also battle with looking at her and, and loving her as my wife, but then also she's still a woman. So mm -hmm. I still have these, you know, these feelings of, comparing myself to her to her standard of beauty mm -hmm. and so we've had conversations and it's helped us as well to just talk about you know my what what the, what the experience is like when me and her would go to the pool and she could just hop in and then I'm over here like don't splash my hair right <laughs> <laughs> so so I have a, I have a question about that um that dynamic because yeah. um well being that you're a lesbian you probably won't be able to speak to it too much but I'm sure your conversations with uh your your um sorority sisters or just friends female friends in general how do they feel about the black man dating outside of his race or dating someone more of a I guess European uh type uh that 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 image that's been thrown at us in society so much 
you know, it's so interesting between talking to my line sisters and just talking on ABF, I think we're torn. I don't, I don't think anybody has a, some people might, you know, say yes, I agree or no, I don't agree. Most of my people are torn. Like, I'll give you an example. These movies come out that are so pro-black and these, you know, these actors are, ta- are recreating these stories that are so important to black history. And we'll all be rooting for it. And then the premiere night will happen and then they'll walk on the red carpet and almost every time it's a white woman on the black actor's arm. Mm -hmm. And every time it's not like we're against interracial dating. I mean, not at all, but it still is almost like, can, can black women only be loved in the movie? Like, can we have that position in real life? Um, if there was just some some sort of balance, I think that Black women would feel a lot better about it. Um, that's why Sterling K. Brown was like just such a rock star. It's like you're telling these Black ass stories and you have a Black ass wife. Mm-hmm. She's Black. She's not like mixed or anything. She is Black. Mm-hmm. She's a Black woman. Um, so I don't. I don't think it, none of my people have any issues with it. I just think they just want for everybody to just be responsible and understanding the why, just like myself, understanding the implications that can happen with marrying someone who's not all black. Like I, I, I now see that in my own family, I see that, you know, I have a mixed niece. Mm-hmm. I see her not understanding what it means to be black mm-hmm. because she's, since she has a mixed family, she's mm-hmm. viewing color, like literally. Mm-hmm you're white or you're brown because that's how she's processing it at such a young age mm-hmm. so so when i when i say auntie's black she'll correct me she'll be like you're not black you're brown like get it right <laughs> and i realized that that's very different than my upbringing in a fully black household it was just kind of understood because those those were the only color references mentioned was black mm-hmm. so it's just a, it's, it's just a lot that goes into it but yeah, I'm not against it. Do you? Right. Just be mindful while doing you. Okay. That's all okay. I ask. And don't abandon while doing you. Like still understand that a black woman is beautiful even if you chose, even if you fell in love with a white woman. Gotcha. Gotcha. So with the trope of, of the ABF, like being everywhere, you know, you got intolerance in the workplace, mm. issues in our community, you know, our homes and relationships. Uh, today, uh, currently with the ABF, what is fueling your anger most right now? I don't know if anything's fueling my anger. I mean, if anything, I, I don't feel like I'm in an angry space right now. I feel like I'm just in a fed up space. And I'm not even fed up with what's very interesting about this page. If you would have asked me a year ago when I started it, yes, I was starting it in response to what they, quote unquote, were doing to us. This page has helped me realize that they are not the problem anymore. Okay? So I'm not even mad at them anymore. We know their game. We mm. know their values. We know how they move. We know their behaviors. We are about to be 400 years outside of the first arrival of the first enslaved African. Mm-hmm. We have enough material and evidence and history at this point to understand how they move. Right now, I'm just fed up with how we are responding to it. Because it's like we are just in this cyclical process where we just won't get off the merry-go-round with them. Mm-hmm. So if anything, yeah, I'm just, I'm just frustrated with us as a people. I don't know how we get out of it. You know, me and my sister, we had a great conversation. I knew, you know, because six, six, the celebration, or not celebration, that's a horrible term, but the commemoration of 1619 is next year. So mm-hmm. I was like, damn, it's been 400 years. And I was like, let me look up just how long the average empire lasts. And it's 352 years. And I was like, wait, we're almost 50 years past how long empires normally fall. I was like, damn, these white people did a number on us because I don't even know if we're near helping it collapse. I pray that we are. Well, I think 45 is doing a pretty good job at that. <laughs> I think so? I think it started I started a little bit um I, um some time ago I think our generation and generation probably right, right before us maybe um started that process. I mean there's been some, some major setbacks in in the movement, but I think that there's enough people um 
in sparsity across the U.S. or across the areas or even internationally, they're like, hey, it's time for you guys to make a move. It's time for you guys to realize that you have more power in yourself. And I think that's coming in play. And, you know, I think seeing um, President Barack um, come in and do that really sparks some energy. And I think that allowed us as our um, – you know, us for our kids and so forth to say, hey, you have the ability to change. I think our parents may still be in a mindset, well, some of our parents, because I can't say all of us, but are still in a mindset that, well, you know, we can't do too much, can't do this. But I think now it's, start, it's changed. And I think that the uh, empire may be on its, on its last leg now um, because we're doing things to make uh, the reaction so harsh. And the shooting's now happening. It's, 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 it's coming to an end. So let me ask, can I ask all of y'all, do, I mean, each one of you fellas, do you all think we'll see that collapse within our lifetime, even if we're 70? It depends on what you're defining as the collapse. If mm -hmm. you're saying in terms of blacks taking a control as the whites have taken in America, I don't think so. Let me get some volume, Mike. Let me get some volume. Uh, if you're saying in terms of the collapse being the blacks taking control of America just as the whites have, I don't think so. Uh, if you're saying the collapse in terms of a unification of the black community to resist continued oppression by white people, I do think that will happen on a larger scale where we will be able to witness it um, and kind of see a change going forward. I think the presidency of Obama was kind of that point where it started to steer in a different direction, which is why I think you have 45 in the position that he's in because they realized that there was a major shift that was happening where there was a unification of blacks in a political process to where they utilized the system that was created for their benefit. Mm -hmm. And it immediately got folks on the other side, like we need to do something about it, so we're gonna do the same. But I think that now people realize playing the game and doing things the correct way by how the system was created and the framework of it, you can have sustainable change. So I do in fact think now that there is a plan that is being developed for who 46 will be. And I think once that happens, that will begin the downhill movement to get people to truly be on a different plane. Yeah, I definitely feel that, you know, Barack was the, the initial spark, right? It, it really gave a lot of minorities that first chance to really feel the truth of it being attainable. You know, as a youngster, I was told, you know, it's attainable, but to not see anybody in that seat who looked like me, it still seemed, you know, like not a reality. But I think after the spark of forty of, of Barack, when you come into forty five now, he's like the 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 flame and the 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 uh, catalyst of really seeing and exposing that everything that uh you know a majority feels has been oh, you know, racism is washed away. There's no racism in America. Seeing as exposed and over and over again with the internet being able to show you every layer of it, it's making that change and showing those future uh, people the ability to see how truly prevalent and right now it still is, that that's that change that's rolling up right now. I look at my daughter and I see the... Um, how, how neutral she is in the sense of just like you were talking about with your niece, that they do not worry about color. They don't see it the same way. Mm -hmm. And and there's the, the uh, while trying to maintain, let her know her history, I still try to respect and, and leave her neutrality in a sense of, I don't want you to um, feel that you are superior or, or excuse me, inferior or feel that there's any type of, you know, they are the the, the uh, majority and, and you should feel that you are minority. But at the same time, you do need to know your history and understand how to move accordingly and, and understand how you will be viewed, especially by um, older people who don't understand and see and know where you came from. And so seeing those pieces build, I do believe in our lifetime, we're going to see some amazing changes in, in an evening of the playing field but I don't think it's going to be so drastic that, you know, by the time we're 70, minorities are going to be, um, I don't, I, I feel we all have power. It's going to be more of an equal playing field as opposed to feeling like somebody is going to, like, like blacks are going to all of a sudden now be the majority and be on top and be just this, you know, superior race. I think it's just 
the, the playing field is evening to where there's going to be a true feeling of unity across all places in that the racism, hatred is getting stomped out and, and a flashlight pointed on it a lot more aggressively nowadays. Hmm. Yeah, so there's, there's so many places that I want to go with what y'all are saying, but I, I think what we're seeing is that the movement is happening and what has uh, made it possible for the movement to happen the way that it is, is social media and Facebook and things like yep. that. Because if you go historically, there is a reason why segregation had to end. Segregation had to end because when we were segregated, we were thriving in our communities um, both socially, economically, and that was something that they couldn't let continue to happen. So integration was really just a higher sense of infiltration really into being able to watch us, watch what we're doing. It enabled us to divide our black leadership, which those of us that have this type of thoughts, we are the current black leaders, but because we're not in the actual community, it's hard for them to see the, the, the visibility of that. And social media has lifted that veil now. So things like www.anangryblackfemale.com um, are helping to drive this movement that's happening now. So I think we will see it. And if you think about it now, when you think about all the legislation and things around social media and the internet, they're trying to control or bring up things to control what people now have access to and bandwidth and all types of things because they see it coming. They know that this is a movement and you're absolutely right. Uh, President Obama's campaign, there was a huge social media, uh, web internet push that drove that movement. So yeah, we did see that and we realize now what that power is. So I think in our time, by the time we're seventies, um, yeah, we're gonna see it happen. Um, and I don't think that it's necessarily going to be, as you said, um, fresh, it's not going to be black people, but because everybody emulates us and wants to be like us, black, mm -hmm. brown, yellow, all of that is coming along with us. Yes. So that's what's going to make the switch. Mm. Easy. Powerful. ABF. I know you got to get out of here pretty soon, man. We appreciate the time that you spent with us. I think we laid a, a great foundation today, actually, man. I, I'm going to ask that you come back on the podcast. Uh, we'll set that up. But we definitely, definitely appreciate you coming through. Um, before we get, before we let you go, um, is there any message that you want to kind of leave with the people before you get out of here? Um, I, I just think our Black is beautiful, man. Like, we're dope. <laughs> like, Black people are lit. <laughs> Dope like, as for fuck. real, we're dope as fuck. <laughs> like, if nothing else, ABF has shown me, this conversation has shown me, like, I'm like, I love Black people. You know, I can't really go into, uh, y'all already know I'm under an alias, but like, I'm not new to this rooting for everybody Black. Like, I have pictures, my dad was a social was a social activist. So, you know, like, growing up, I, I rocked Malcolm X hats and Mandel, um, you know, um, medallions and all of that and I'm so I don't care if it's on trend I don't care if you're just doing it because it's the popular thing to do I'm just I'm just riding this wave of everyone being proud to be black right now you know whatever brought you here I don't care I'm just happy that you came to the party and so um yeah man thanks for what y'all are doing I'm excited to hear more podcasts um yeah I hope you guys have a blessed Easter um and a good Sunday Awesome, awesome. Before you leave, uh, yeah, where I appreciate you. And um, I just want to say before what you're about to say, when you go listen to some of the other podcasts, we don't always have our high intelligence hats on, so be oh. careful. <laughs> <laughs> we I definitely wish... get down and have fun on some. I on know, some, man. It's just about the fun, so, you know. Oh, I, no, I'm, down. I'm down for that. I'm d I, I love that. Uh, maybe if I come on again, we can have a lighter, more, you know. I know, cause uh, I wish you could stay for the for the duration, man. Because we're gonna get into some other stuff, and I, I would I'm very interested to hear your your take on it. But I know you got to get up out of here. Um, where can uh, you know our listeners and your fans, you know, get connected with you? Not fans, we're all a community. I don't community. have followers. We're all just ABS. And if you okay. want to follow us, it's an Insta blog, so everything's on Instagram um, at Angry Black Female. So um, check us website. out. Yeah, check us out, and. Um, the website will just bring you straight back to the Instagram. Like it's truly just a blog. Like, oh, okay. Even though we have merch now, 
I didn't create the merch. Like I created my logo and then mm. some ABF said they wanted to rock it. And mm -hmm. so I went and got merch mm -hmm. for them. So it's truly a community. Like I don't even feel like I own the space. ABF send me topics. ABFs get features on the page. Um, we're a community, man. I just feel like I'm just the curator behind the space. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, fellas. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank Appreciate you. Joining us on this holiday morning. All yes. right, you guys take care. You too. Right, bye bye. Easy. That was good. That was good, fellas. Um, yeah, I want to talk about being back at the crib, man. Got to go to Six Flags with my son yesterday. Ooh. The little guy is hilarious. Hold on, so hold on, hold on, hold on. Hey, hey, hey. You, female, black female, don't turn us off. Don't Keep listening. Don't turn it off. <laughs> hey, listen. We appreciate y'all joining us this yeah, week. It ain't time for you to go. <laughs> Angry black female uh, followers. Yeah, don't, 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 don't turn us off. Don't do us like the Beyonce followers. Don't do it like that. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> And you see the diversity of the podcast now. So go ahead and get the, get your subscribe on, man. Get your comments on. Give us the uh, the five star rating. Get the uh, notification button. Get notified. All of that good stuff. Stay connected with us here on the 13th floor. The our Leave us some comments. Leave us some comments. If you liked this episode and you want to see ABF back on the podcast again, leave us some comments to verify that. And there are certain people that your vote is disqualified. Um, you know who you are. I ain't gonna make you <laughs> uh, but yeah, easy, easy. So yeah, man, I got in last uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, you know, I met uh, him and his mom at the Six Flags. Uh, he didn't know I was coming, so it was a surprise. But my son is so unbothered; like he's so much like me, and that <laughs> uh, you you can't really expect a, a a great reaction. So when I walk up behind him at the park, I call his name. He turns around and he looks at me, and I got my sunglasses on. So he looking. He's like. Daddy, I take my my glasses off. Kellen, what's up, man? And he looks, he's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> like, I came for your birthday, man. What do you mean, what am I doing here? So we give him a hug and everything. And, you know, we walking around the park with his mom. And he had a friend come with him. Um, and, you know, they're all on, on the roller coasters. And, uh, you know, there's this, like, catwalk in some area. I got to send y'all the video. Little bro is fearless man like running around on the catwalk not holding on to any of the side like just takes off and you know it's like one of those bridges where it's like rope so it yeah, twists yeah, and yeah. turns with you All but right. his like balance and momentum just carries him straight across so he doesn't even like falter at all um like and it was a warrior out there huh right like it's amazing just watching him do all of this stuff man like he's so He's so amazing. Uh, yeah, just, and in, in the picture that you posted, like, man, that dude has grown since the last time I yeah. saw him in Maryland. Yeah, he is. He's up to my hip now, man. And, uh, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do with this guy. I think he's going to be an <laughs> easy 6-2, um, playing football this Six. year. He loves basketball, so we're going to get on the basketball court a little, uh, for a little bit today. Um, but two things I want to get into. The first thing is uh, <laughs> how we uh, – kind of basically tricked him um so there's this roller coaster there and like i said fearless he wants to get on every big roller coaster on the map and we're walking past him he's like i want to get on that one and that one and that one and you know he's like three feet tall so we uh we're walking up to him and walking past him and like kellen i don't think you're gonna be able to get on these so there's this one roller coaster he's just been dying to go to all day long um i think it's what the scorpion at the bush gardens so we finally go over there after, you know, riding all the baby roller coasters and eating turkey legs and ice cream and funnel cakes and all that other stuff. And we get over there and me and his mom are like, uh, you know, I Kellen, I don't think you're going to be able to get on, man. You might be too short. So we get over there and he is he makes the cut by like this much. And I'm just like, oh, this line is so long. It's like six o'clock, man. We can't stay in this line for another hour and a half so we can get on this roller coaster. So we basically had to tell him, like, you know, you're not tall enough yet. But when I come back to get him in May, you know, if you eat all your vegetables and, you know, listen to your mom and everything, you're going to grow about an inch. And when we come back in May, we'll go to Bush Gardens and you'll be able to get on. But um, it was just amazing. Like, he was just so dead set on it, put it out into the atmosphere. And even us as a parents, you know, just being protective over the child. Like, I think we talked about this before on the podcast, girl, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with, with Nia and riding the bike, you know, just setting those limitations for him and him just like, no. 
I don't have any limits. I want to go. Let's go check it out. And you know, we afforded him the opportunity. And he was actually right. So it was a it, it was a it was a good moment for me, a good lesson for me to to understand that you don't want to place those limitations. It's not just about the limitations. It's about the fears. I think that that's the biggest thing as parents that we falter at is allowing our fears that we push them and project them onto our children. Oh, I was scared to get on stage, so I'm not going to let my child get on stage and do such. So I was scared to, you know, ride roller coasters, period. So my child ain't getting on a roller coaster. I think one of the best conversations I ever had with my brother-in-law was we were out at um, the fair and we're going to go on the, the Ferris wheel and he didn't want his son to go on the Ferris wheel. And I, I, and anybody who knows me, I'm, I'm, I'm no holds barred. So I turned around and I, I pretty much cussed them out. Like, why are you being such a little girl about X, Y, Z? And if you don't want to go, that ain't got nothing to do with your son. Quit being a sucker. Like I just, I went in on them, <laughs> but <laughs> it, it was the, the um, catalyst that opened his mind to understand like, wait a minute, you know what? You are right. You may not have had the best way of explaining it to me, <laughs> but at the same time, it was that I was correct in telling him, stop projecting your fears onto your son. Let your son, be greater than you. That's what you always tell me you want him to be. But if you're going to go ahead and, and, you know, project your fears on him and not allow him to do things that you were scared of, you, he can, he doesn't have the possibility to be greater. He's always going to be stipend by, you know, those, those levels. Mm -hmm. True. True. Yeah. And then the other thing, um, so I got a question for the group because it was a um, hot topic of conversation in my household. So you are, you guys, uh, most of our listeners, if you're an avid listener, you already know I have a blended family. So my son is not from Chris and my daughter is not from me. Um, so there's different things that'll come up. So this trip being one of them. And the, so originally, you know, I bought my ticket kind of late to go down here for his birthday. Um, and I had spoken to his mom previously to see what she had planned. She told me nothing big. She wasn't going to do anything. So I'm thinking, all right, cool. I'm just coming for a free weekend. I'll figure out what we're going to do when I get here. When I buy the ticket, which is probably like two weeks before I come, I call her and, you know, I tell her, you know, I'm coming in on Saturday this time, you know, we're going to groove after that. She lets me know, oh, I think we're going to go to Disney World. So immediately I'm like, okay. I'm coming to Disney World then. How much is tickets? <laughs> or whatever. Um, and it's not even a second thought because I hadn't seen my son in so long because I couldn't make it down there for Christmas because we was having car trouble. Um, so the last time I saw him was in August. So I hadn't seen him in so long. I was on the fence about whether I was going to be able to afford this trip, but I was like, nah, I got to go. And so she said she's going to Orlando. I'm like, cool, I'll make it down there. Now, when I relay that information to the wife, she's like, oh, so you're going on a family vacation. Mm. Uh, right. So I'm like, well, no. I'm going down there to see my son. And his mom said last minute that she was thinking about taking him to Disney World. It's a bigger issue because we've been trying to take Nia to Disney World for like two years. Just couldn't really, we couldn't do it. Uh, so it puts me in between a rock and a hard place because I have to see my son. Uh, and Everybody knows I'm not going down there for any other reason but to see my son. But her thing is, you know, the visuals and the impact that it might have on Kellen, um, seeing his mom and his dad sharing the same space, which we've never done. He's never seen that before. Um, and he asks questions now. Like he asked me the other day um, about, you know, where, where, when he was a baby, did, you know, I live with his mom. So he's starting to, you know, see and understand certain things. Yep. Right. So, you know, and we'll deal with it as it comes because he's a kid, you know, it's like shiny object syndrome. It's, it's a topic right now, but 30 seconds later, he's not even thinking about it. But the issue in the household was just that, you know, do I or, or how do you handle going down um, and being in that space? Because, you know, ultimately we ended up in Bush Gardens, but being in that space where, you know, your partner, your significant other is feeling slighted or feeling some type of way about the way that you're handling that situation with your son and his, you know, mother and how that potentially impacts your current household. Well, yeah, I think I'm the only other one with a blended family. Right. Coach K with his uh, muted microphone. Um, <laughs> 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 but <laughs> I definitely, um, you know me, I'm Mr. Live Through Intentions. 
and, yeah, and they are always going to understandably, you know, you can see where her, I don't want to say fear, but where her thought process was coming from and where her, you know, trying to, in a sense, um, inflate what is really going on. And while, yes, there's the potential of him seeing, you know, mommy and daddy together for the first time that, you know, it, it might, it, there's potential for impact on him, but it's also how you handle the situation. It's not mm -hmm. like you guys were walk, gonna walk around the park holding hands and exactly. hanging out and everything else. It's the understanding, how you move, how you relate to each other, how you relate to him and the understanding he has, but then also the intention, she is going to get mad. She is going to have, and I won't say mad, but- She's just gonna feel some type of way. Feel yeah. some type of way. And I understand everybody. it. Everybody has insecurities, but it's it's not for you to allow someone else to, you know, that that piece, it's about you explaining, understanding if she's going to hold on to it for a little bit. There's nothing you can do to um to uh alleviate that in a sense. Right. Just simply because it's about how you handle it. The fact that you, you still need to go see your son. There's absolutely. absolutely nothing that she's going to be able to say that should dictate and push you away from going to see your son because that was the ultimate goal. It wasn't about you going down there to hang out with your, you know, your baby uh, mother. It was about you going down there to hang out with your son and then exactly. knowing and understanding that you will move forward correctly in the way that you're supposed to, that you love your wife and that, you know, you're going to see your son. You're not going down there for a family vacation and it's okay to, uh, that she, you know, she, she threw that shade out there and she <laughs> had, you know, took that sneak this. But at the same time, it's about being like, you know what? You understand where my, my thought process is, baby. You understand that I this is this is my home. And, you know, while uh, this is my home and my family, however, my son is the extended part of my family. And I'm not going to deny him, especially with the limited amount of visibility and interaction that I truly do get. I'm not going to allow that to take my uh you know my time together with him and let me make sure i i, I bring it full circle because that it, it was never a question i mean of whether i was going to go or not like she understands that you know i have to go so i don't want to put that perception out there um, but the other piece that i think sometimes gets or, or mothers especially single mothers who have custodial um the are the primary custodial parent lose um sight of is the fact that the man, myself in this situation, has a very limited amount of power when it comes to the things that are going on with my son. And I say that because, you know, the, the conversation then switched to, you know, her being able to, you know, plan these types of things and the impact that it's going to have on your family here. And unfortunately, you know, I have a very good partner who's a single mother, well, not a single mother now, but was a single mother, and she's very sane. You know, she th she's very thoughtful when it comes to her child and how she would deal with them and, and, and as it pertains to the father. Um, and I don't know, I don't have that same level. <laughs> I don't have that same level of thought when it comes to, you know, my baby mother. Her primary concern is her son. Everything else is typically ancillary. And that's not to say that she causes any friction or drama, but if she wants to do something with her son, that's what she's going to do. Um, and it, I can have the conversation around being more thoughtful as how it pertains to my, my group, but that's just about as far as it goes. You know, I, I can't control anything outside of that. And I think, you know, women who have, oh, I had to actually tell her, like you being the mother of your child who can, you basically have full custody and can come and go as you please with her. You can do these types of things. You, you, you're sane enough, you know, you're logical enough. I, I don't have that. I'm, I, I literally get, you know, what I'm kind of given whether it be through the system or her. Now, granted, she's really good about most things, but there are some things where it's, a, it's like pulling teeth sometimes. So, you know, the women in those situations, she just has to be mindful of that. 100%. And it is those, um, you know, special situations where it's nobody, nobody else right now on the podcast lives that life. You know what I mean? And, and, and mm. truly understands while I do have a stepdaughter, you know, I don't have um, a child that is my own that is living with, you know, another person, you know, living with their, their mother. So it's a total different, you know, feeling, but it's about that understanding that communication 
that that open playing field and again the the understanding on your side of I know my intention I'm not going on a family vacation I know she threw that out there just on some you know it was a little jab and instead of you taking it in in in, in wilding out you know you were able to understand take the jab and, and go ahead and give a woo saw of the hey I know that it's not you you know that I'm not going down there on some, you know, acting like we're about to hang out and I'm going to be walking around the park with my, you know, hugged up on my baby mama with my son. You know, that's not what's going on. I'm going down here to, to see my son and, and to, you know, enjoy some time with him. And being able to have that open dialogue, have that open playing field, that's what made it a successful trip and allowed you to enjoy it as opposed to there's nothing worse than going to something that you're supposed to enjoy and have half that weight there, they, they right here just talking to you and, and, and losing all your concentration and ability to enjoy the moment because all you're doing is hearing that conversation mm-hmm. that that nagging and that that oh you just that it's beautiful that you were able to go ahead and do exactly what you were supposed to ultimately enjoy your son you're still muted you still you need to no your, your, your mic just sucks it's cool <laughs> we have so much to say. I know you want to move on from this topic, so I'll probably try to wrap it up if I can. Um, but living both those lives, so one living the life as a as a um, as a product of a single you know mom, um, and then having a stepdad come in seeing that from the upside view is is like you know my mom would say things to my dad like hey you know make sure you're doing this or doing that but my stepdad mr tim would always make sure that my dad knew hey um this is the plan of action so i, I don't know if you brett you guys have had those who connect with each other as like adults to say hey this is my this is my my well, my lady and this is my past um we gotta we have to work together as a family because we are one family that conversation they had really allowed him stuck my dad not ever worry about have that fear of that process now it could be a man a man thing it makes it easier than a female it's a female thing and i don't want to generalize but i think that's where you in the middle have that conversation say hey you know this is where it's about my son i need you guys to be able to interact and, and know that i love you and i <laughs> love in the past you but you know in the middle of the day the love is for my son and that was a that would that made things much easier for my mom and for my dad and everything else so so yeah, I mean, this thing's been going on for five years now. So they they, they know each other very well. It was actually shocking. Yeah, it's that that conversation has been had. I was actually shocked the other day because they just had a conversation amongst themselves. And when Chris t- <laughs> when Chris told me about it, I was like, what? <laughs> and it's not like there's anything wrong with it. It's just not something that I expected to hear at the time. So you know, everything's all good on that front. Um, Faison. We got it. Coach K, is your mic working yet? Probably not. Oh, he's back in the game. Yeah. What's up, baby? Yeah. Hold on, I was going to say one side note. All um, blended families, make sure to have that open dialogue. Like, I am very, um, well, I won't say I'm very cool with my uh, daughter's, you know, biological father, but I at least am, you know, kosher with him. I can talk to him on the phone. There is no animosity or no weirdness. If anything's going down with Taylor, there's easy uh, open lines of communication. And I stress that everybody has that. If you have a blended family or, you know, have a baby mom or baby father, let the animosity go. Understand it's about the child. It's about the kid, man. Exactly. Put it on making better members of society and pushing towards a better future. Let that animosity go. I tell you, it'll help your life be better. Run it! So, Faison, we got to come to you real quickly for your for Arts Corner and then hit fresh with the uh, Crypto Bitty so we can get Coach K out of here. Got it. So, um, learn to listen. I think today we got that process going. Um, but opportunities sometimes knock very softly. Um, angry Black Female, just listen. She had an opportunity and she ran with it. We at the same thing. You know, just sometimes you got to just be quiet and listen. And very, very subtly in the background, you hear that opportunity to make change or to adapt or to move forward so learn to listen so wait is that namdi or renze this is this is namdi now namdi the okay. switch up 
<laughs> so, so Namdi was taking advantage of his opportunity to jump in easy. Yeah, yeah, he was upstairs screaming, and, and I was like, "Bring him downstairs. He wants to see daddy." So now he's like relaxed and chilling. <laughs> <laughs> hey, fresh, what you got for us this week at crypto, man? Um, it's been another interesting week. We have seen uh, the shutdown of advertisements across Facebook, across Google, across really? Twitter. Um, so, uh, this has created a lot of what we call FUD, word you've heard me say before, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, which definitely sends a ripple effect through the market. Uh, we've seen the actual uh, Bitcoin drop below 7K. It's actually at about six and a half right now. It has been hovering between about eight and 9K over the past month. So this has definitely been interesting watching the drop, but as they say, it is the the uh, you know the the big guys pretty much shaking out the idle hands and mm. pushing out the the weak uh, minded and the people who really don't understand what cryptocurrency is. And a lot of those people who jump in December uh, into the space, unknowing what was going on, fueled by lending platforms seeing all of that come crashing down. I mean, we were sitting at 20K Bitcoin back in December and for it to be down at six and a half right now, there are many people who have uh, taken quite a loss because they didn't have a true understanding of the space. But with all that said, as usual, I encourage you to do your own research because there are still a lot of great opportunities. I'm still a strong believer in Bitcoin's um, ability to be a, a staple in as far as a way to do transactions, it's going to be important in the future. It's going to have its rise again, but not just Bitcoin, the many different altcoins and um, opportunities that are out there. So do your research, make sure you get in into the game, understand what's going on, check out the website, Crypto with Fresh, check out my Facebook page and all that other good stuff. We out here, we experience, we learning. Grow with me, let's get it. Let's get it. Ladies and gentlemen, before we wrap this thing, I want to remind you that you can get this podcast on iTunes, Google Play. Uh, you can watch the videos on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at 13th Floor. Please let us know what you think. And if you want, sh- drop us a line. 13th Floor at Flagology.com. Coach K, your mic back on? I, I hope so. What you got for the people there? What I got for the people. So by the time you hear this, it will no longer be Easter, but we absolutely recorded this on Easter, uh, which is the celebration of a man that they say rose from the dead. <laughs> we weren't there, so we can't verify. Mm. Rise from man, the you dead. About to, uh, why you just do that, man? <laughs> or did, hey, come on, man. We can't verify. Did he rise from oh, the dead? Or did the like, movement known as Jesus rise from the dead? And what I'm trying to challenge y'all with is that you get caught up in so much small stuff. They were talking about the man, he's this, he's that, you know. But at the end of the day, once they got past the small stuff, they could see the lesson and the teaching and they could join in that movement. So what I'm challenging you with is for angry black female and for those of us that want to see a change get out of the small stuff so that you can get to the goal of the movement and that we can all rise together. Mm. I like that. I like that. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. We out of here. Hope you enjoyed your Easter Sunday. I'm going to get back to the family. You guys, I appreciate y'all time. That's it, man. We're done here on the 13th floor. Where the furniture isn't always the best, but the views are amazing. I don't have any bunny ears. The 13th floor. The 13th floor. The 13th floor.